Hi, this is episode 80 of First Tempo, and our special guest for this podcast seminar is Mark Lebedew, the head coach of Friedrichshafen. Hi, Mark, and thank you for accepting the invitation uh, to be the lecturer of, in this podcast seminar. Uh, my pleasure, Bogdan. I'm very happy to be here. Our uh, Let's start with that one. Let's explain what the seminar is going to be because it's not for a specific topic like reception or defense or, or surf or attack or whatever. Uh, you have a rubric in your website at home on, on, on the court. Uh, and its title is What Just Happened? So in this regard, uh, we named the podcast seminar Thinking About What Just Happened. So we're going to think about specific volleyball situations, specific videos, and you can uh, explain further what is the exact idea. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bogdan. The... The, the actions or the, the idea of the video series, if you want to call it that, is to look at some actions that happen in real games, so actions that have happened, that look like normal volleyball, the kind of things that we see uh, every day, uh, but to go one or two, and maybe on one of them we go three levels uh, down to see where there might have been, uh, let's say, the real error. So there's a there's a point of the game where somebody hits out or or sets the wrong ball that's obvious for everybody to see, but uh, really often there's uh, an error that's unnoticeable earlier in the rally uh, that manifests itself three or four or five, sometimes one or two net crosses later. And the basic theme is... Uh, that, that I've come up with is that uh, in every, nearly every volleyball uh, situation, there is a right, a right solution. There are lots of solutions, but there is most often just one right solution and one right player to play the ball. And we'll see how and where that, uh, that breaks down or that concept breaks down yeah we have 12 clips which uh, we are going to see uh, but before starting with the first one i'm going just to uh, invite you to to comment uh, to to ask questions with regard to the videos or regard to to anything other which you seem um for you appropriate to ask mark of course if he's able to to answer it and of course, you can also express your opinions for what you see. Um, uh, so I believe we can start with the first one. Um, let's do it. Let's let's do it. Uh, I would like to to mention that we can watch it several times. We can pause it in a specific um, moment if that is needed. So we let's start with the first video. So we have a high ball situation, a really common situation, a ball bounces in front of position six. And let's watch it. Let's go two more times. And this is a play that we really often see. And the first reaction to that is that uh, this is a simple ball that position six should take. Uh, and really clear uh, example of what in English we call uh, often a non-effort. And uh, I wrote about this one, uh, and this is a ball that uh, in a lot of situations could be played uh, by the position six, but the point that I wanted to make with this one is to watch the action um, as the spiker touches the ball of the position one defender. So let's go it again and let's look at position one defender and his movement. We go back and that little stutter step, let's show one more time. 
he runs, he starts to run to the net and he stops and then comes into the court. And that is the key moment in this play. So what just happened, the thing that we that we saw, the thing that everybody saw was the missed defense. But the key action in this situation is the movement of the setter uh, from position one. And so, yeah, yep. he's missed, he, he has misled the, the player in position six, uh, the setter. I mean, because he, he just started to move a little bit and then just uh, started moving in another direction. And that, that was the, the bad sign for, the, for, uh, for number for position six player. Exactly. The, uh, the, the movement, so the, we talk all the time about calling in volleyball and that you should call for the ball and everybody needs to call and talk to each other and so, et cetera, et cetera. But the most powerful communication is the eyes. And when player position six sees the player in position one, and you can see that he's in his line of sight. And as soon as one player sees another player go for the ball, they always hesitate. And it doesn't matter who calls, how loud, whatever, uh, whatever the rules are, as soon as one player sees a player in front of him or her move towards the ball, they hesitate. And in this case, you'll see, you saw that even though the ball was pretty close, to him, the hesitation was enough that uh, that he couldn't get the ball. And there are some things that make this uh, a little bit more uh, in this particular situation that makes it stand out a little bit more is that in posi position six normally is not responsible for any tips because the players in one and five are coming towards the middle of the court. And so as soon as position six sees a tip, he already says, okay, I'm not in the play. Then he sees position one, start to move towards the ball, and then he's out of the play. Okay, now I have to get ready to attack. And by the, by the time that he figures out that uh, <laughs> it's gonna land on my foot, um, it's too late. Okay, let's go to the next one then. I believe that was pretty um, detailed explanation of what what just happened in uh, in this first situation in the Polish league. Okay, let's go to the next one. I'll, I'll move this one and okay, let's go to this one. Okay, again, it's a pretty standard situation. Uh, it it, good, it looks too it looks too obvious, probably. What or, is the what is there? <laughs> okay. Well, we we start with a bad reception. The uh, attacker in position four makes a pretty good solution from a bad situation. He plays high off the block, and then. Uh, the white team defends, but the high ball set is bad. And uh, then the, the blue team, Vashava, uh, ends up winning the winning the point. Is that what you see, Bogdan? Where where do you see the error there? Uh, the setter shouldn't have taken the first ball. She, he should have left it to the player in position six in order for him to, to organize then the, the attack from the second touch. I think that you have nailed it exactly. So if we stop it just before the contact, the setter is, uh, I, we can't see if I, if we were in a classroom, we could, uh, I could point to it, but the setter has run all the way across in front of uh, position six. So he's gone where he doesn't need to be. The second problem is, of course, that the first, that the contact is bad. So, firstly, it's uh, the setter's not in the play, and the contact is bad. 
and then the set is a disaster. So the, it all comes from the setter going out of his position to take the first ball that he doesn't need to take and should not ever take. Yep, let's let's uh, have a look for very last time. I think it's uh, we don't need to look at that more because it's. Uh, I think most it's people pretty simple. That, my, I think most people watching that would say that it's a bad set by the white team that gives the opposite no chance, and it is a bad set. Um, I don't know why he uses the bugger, but the. The problem is caused by the setter taking the first ball. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Um, so it's... we have three. Um, so that's it. Okay, let's have a look at that one. I don't even bother okay. going to the end of the rally. Uh, and we don't need to beat around the bush here. This is the, the same situation. The setter same one, yeah. <laughs> takes the first ball. He takes a free ball. He steps in front of the middle blocker. And now it's a high ball situation instead of um, three or four attackers. And uh, this is something that, it happens a lot of times in big in big games with big teams. Um, they they get a bit lazy or they trust their maybe they say I trust my high ball hitter. Um, but in the the blog post that accompanies these videos, the I uh, go through actually what the difference is the success rate of hitting a high ball versus uh, hitting a fastball or or first tempo and and the difference is is really. Uh, is really huge, and okay, yeah. Sorry, go on. I I talk about this with uh, with my setters. So I, sometimes my setter, especially in practice, will say I have to take this ball because nobody will uh, will take it otherwise. And this is a game, obviously, but uh, in practice, I say let the, they have to let the ball bounce because if they don't let the ball bounce, then nobody will be ready to receive the free ball. In this case, the player was ready to receive the free ball, was just a, a lazy play by the setter. Okay, but let's develop it a little bit further. Uh, firstly, which player should uh, should take the ball? The middle blocker here? Or it's, uh, is there any possibility for a different player to do it? I can see, for example, if, if there's a libero on the court. Uh, the the libero is on the court because he sets the he sets this ball, but the the ball over the net is a good play by the by the Zabiecha player. Um, it's going close to the net, but you can if you let it go uh, two or three rallies, you can see the middle blocker is in position. If the setter took one step back, then uh, the middle blocker would take this ball. You can see he's right underneath the ball. And maybe yeah. he couldn't then attack the free ball, uh, but he would allow a fast ball, fast ball, two fast balls, and a pipe. Another yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, another question. I think is a little bit modern these days that such a ball like this one could be set from the first touch to position four. Because I, I believe I, I believe it's very appropriate for such an action, just to set it. I, it's 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 just like a, almost almost like a like a, a ball which is received or defended, but from just from the other side. So it's I believe it's very suitable for setting directly. You you are ahead of me, Bogdan. You're exact. You're absolutely right. Uh, this is the perfect situation where the uh, where you can set directly to uh, any player, actually, the, the pipe. Uh, you'll see this one set a lot to uh, position four as well. Um, sometimes position four is ready, sometimes not. Uh, but uh, if the setter's taking this ball to set it, then I agree. 
Um, I'm not sure that that's the case here, though. Okay, and last question on this one for me. Uh, do you have always uh, the instruction who is going to set if the setter takes the first ball? We, in my team, we normally play exactly what you were, what you were talking about, uh, that we want to put the ball where position six can attack or set. Um, yeah. So that's the that's our our basic play. Um, if this if it's a defensive situation uh, that the ball's high in the middle of the court, then I'm happy for a setter to set. Uh, sorry, the libero to set. Or I don't have the really strong rules that some teams have that position six has to set. Um, I the first option is to play for position six to attack or set. Um, but if it's a difficult situation the setter can't control, then whoever's in the best situation uh, should play the ball. Okay, we have a question from Yanis Kolo Kolosovskis. What do you think about... Okay, I will remove this. What do you think about the orders for the Libero to take the second ball if the setter takes the first? Actually, we a little were a little bit ahead of, of this of, ahead of this uh, question, but still you, you can answer. Uh, I'm happy for the the libero to, to play the ball. Like I said, the first option, position six, can attack or set. Um, but if in a different situation, uh, if the I like it if this if the libero can play fast. Um, if the libero has a chance to play. Uh, to play fast, to play pipe uh, with the Australian team. With Luke Perry, we, we played that a lot. It was a, a set play that, uh, that Perry would set the, the pipe um, and uh, it, it also works, works very well. There is a question which is not specifically linked to this situation, but uh, let's uh, check it uh, now. What is the determining factor to move your liver to zone six in defense in some or all the rotations? Is it based on your player's individual defensive skills or it depends on the attack of the opponent? That's a, that's a great question. That's probably a one hour webinar just by itself. Um, the, I can go in two different directions with this and I've done, I've done both of these. One is, uh, to have the, uh, if players have different skills, um, the, the, the libero uh, can, if uh, Eric Shoji, for example, when he played in my team, we used him in position six a lot because he was amazing at reading the balls that hit the block. So he could cover the whole of the backcourt and uh, our position six guys were both pretty good at uh, or sorry, our receivers were both good at defending the strong attack. So it made sense for Eric to play in that position. Uh, with Luke Perry, what we did uh, was that Luke went more or less where he thought the ball was going to go. So if there was a strong server, um, then the chance was a high ball. So he played in position six. If um, if the opposite liked to hit line, then uh, he would play in position five. If on the second uh, ball in the series um, that the first ball was going to be for the the first ball was a point for us and the second the setter liked to play with the the opposite on the second ball then he could change position uh, after the first rally so uh, I can do I can do both individual skills and where the ball's most likely to go. Just for your information, uh, Bujan Petev is a co-founder of Bulgarian uh, Volleyball Academy in uh, Illinois, the US. Uh, uh, nice. Very interesting, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, To just to mention that. Uh, uh, just one uh, addition from Yanis to expand the, if there is a possibility for setter to set up zone six player for a pipe attack, why would some... Teams enforce use of Libero to do the set even when setter is in full control of the first touch. Uh, it depends on the team. Uh, it can be it can be that the position six players don't attack well uh, from this pipe, second ball pipe. Um, it can be that the coach 
is more or less conservative depending <laughs> on on uh, some situations. So um, yeah, there are always different reasons to different reasons to do different things. In yeah. in my last team, uh, the Libero was actually probably the worst setter from from everybody. Um, so it it made sense for us to play the the ball directly to the pipe. Yeah, and Tiani Sadis uh, adds that quite few national teams in VNL seems to do it right now. Probably it's not that uh, typical for now, but it's uh, it's becoming more and more. Um, we are becoming more and more familiar with it. Okay, uh, let's go to the next clip. I believe it's the fourth one. Yeah, let's have a look at it again. This is a, a similar situation from the one that uh, the very first action. So uh, we can have a, a discussion about where position six should be. Uh, and for me, position six should be closer to the middle of the court, whatever, whatever the situation. But uh, if we play it again. Uh, the key player that we're looking for here is the one in position five who is steps in front of uh, the other defender and uh, and puts him off, basically. And so the, they look at each other. It's an easy ball. Even from that position, position six should be able to, to get that ball, but position five... Um, by chasing after the ball or or doing something uh, distracts him from from getting after it. I have a question on the middle blocker because in this situation it's pretty obvious that the middle blocker won't be able to get anything. Yeah. But he he, however, he is flying and and probably. If the ball was clean, uh, diagonal, it could be easier to, to defend than, than this one. Am I right or you have a different interpretation of the situation? I think this is an easy ball to defend for position six. Yeah. So the, the middle blocker touches the ball. Uh, we can't see the baseline there, but it lands, I don't know, 10 centimeters yeah. behind the baseline. Um, if the block has a big touch like this, then uh, then you have to defend this ball. For me, you have to defend it. And the uh, my my first thing, which is not the topic that we're talking about here, is that position six should be longer in the court, even one against one. But even from there, he can get this ball if position five doesn't uh, distract him and get in the way. Okay, in, in this situation with the three players here, wh who of them is in the right position, probably position one, and where should be placed the other the other two? Uh, <laughs> uh, of, of course, it could be subjective, but however your opinion, of course. It it is different. Different people have different uh, different ideas, uh, but the it can be that the that this team has some concept uh, that position five will move from the line. Um, I I don't know why or don't why they would, but uh, they can have. So for me, position five should stay close to the line. Uh, it can move off a little left, a little bit right, um, but the. What I think is really happening here is that the players have the freedom to read and go where they want. And the ball is more or less going to the middle of the court and everybody is going together to the middle of the court. But when when players are in the same space, it, it doesn't help. So uh, if the players, if position five stayed close to the line, position one, depending on what the scouting is for the for the spiker is more or less in the right position 
Um, but position six should definitely be further away. He can be on the angle. Um, he can be in the middle of the court, uh, but uh, but there he he can't defend any balls. Position five can't defend any balls, and this is a good defensive or a good blocking situation um, that the, that the team misses out on. Okay, let's go to the next one. So okay, that's one. Do. The next one is this one. Pretty similar. Uh, this, is the, this is the extreme version of of the other one. Position five. Has oh, the first one you mean? The the previous one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Position five reads the reads the situation, chases after the ball. He ends up in another player's area. And this should be an easy defense, but uh, yeah, but it's not. It ends yeah. up being being a, a loss. Just point. with with uh, yeah, uh, I believe uh, our head coach of Bulgaria once said it like a traffic cop, just <laughs> like doing this one. He's, the, he's just in front of the of the of number fifteen here in the position six. So it's yes. I, I have had conversations with Liberos and L Libero position can be really hard to play because you don't have control of your of your situation. You don't have control of, of what you're doing, uh, of how many times you play the ball. And uh, sometimes the Libero has to stay away from the action. And when the Libero chases the action, chases the ball, <laughs> Uh, it's not in this series of clips, but on, on my website, I have one where where the Libro chases to get a free ball and he completely misses a free ball that another person could easily take um, without any stress. But, you know, the, the, the Libro mentality is sometimes it's better for me to take the first ball badly than for somebody else to take the first ball. And, and uh, obviously, I don't agree with that. Yep, I believe this is pretty obvious, so we don't need to, uh, to watch it more. Let's go to number six. Yeah. Oh, yes, number six. Uh, this is the this is the same player that we've. I'll play play the whole rally. Now I'm now I'm a little bit confused. Okay, yeah, this is this the... is the, the one that the same one that we talked about. But in this case, all three players followed the ball. They all ended up in the middle of the court. Maybe if you can stop the uh, just as the defender is touching the ball. And they just they just get in each other's way. If position six is longer, position five is just out of the way, then this can be a more or less easy ball for uh, position one from that position. But they get in each other's way. Six is in in front of position one. Six, position six can never be the closest defender to the three meter line. This is. Uh, uh, for me, this is rule number one. Yeah, and again, the Libro is, I don't know what, what he's doing because from what I can see, probably the the attacker also have the line free. Uh, yeah. Yes, his his body posture is more like I'm going to, to spike the diagonal, but I believe that there is enough space between the antenna and the block to, to attack the, the line, so... It's an interesting uh, movement by the Libro. I think it's the – and all three players are moving towards the same spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they will they will argue, they will say that they read the attack and they were right. They all read the attack and they were right. But in block and in defence, players are responsible 
not for getting every ball, but they are responsible for the balls in their area. And when the ball is outside the area, then they get ready for the second contact or or the third contact. But uh, they don't have to play the first ball. Uh, an, another question on the middle blocker, because uh, I'm interested in that. Uh, let's say because of the fact that, uh, that on an amateur level I play middle blocker. Okay, let's say that in this mm -hmm. position, the middle blocker, uh, I can't see the number, but whoever, one, uh, one I think. Uh, if the middle blocker is not able to to reach and and be be near to the uh, to the end blocker, should he jump? Should he not jump, or sh he should jump just on the uh, on the place where he had reached? In order to make uh, an even block and not just uh, uh, having hands uh, all over the place, I I believe strongly that the that the blocker should block in front where he is. Yeah. So uh, if he the the rule or the way that I describe it to my players is that um, if the ball hits your if the ball hits the blocker's hands, then it goes down it goes up on my side and that's the only options so i don't want to move i don't want to reach i don't want to do anything the ball goes down up or past and all of those actions are, are positive for us because also my defense is not running around like that yeah and yes you can probably find some video of my defense being bad of course yeah, I mean, I mean, because if you if you do it like this one, your hands will be you will be in the direction of out of bounds. So if if the ball touches your hands, touches your palms, yeah. it will be out. But uh, in this regard, I would like to make just a small uh, comparison. I think it was number four. Yeah. Because here, yep, I think. When we touched, yeah. Yeah. The hands of the middle blocker are, I think, yeah, in this here. Yeah. They are just in direction of, of the out. And it's, here. Uh, yep. And here. Uh, no. Just before. Much better, I think. Okay, not not the not perfectly. But I, I believe a little bit better. I think both of those, both actions are on the limit of when the blocker maybe doesn't have to jump. It's so far away that yeah. uh, he can only make a mistake. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's then go to number... Um, okay, number seven. Okay, the one that what we are watching in this play is the action of uh, the setter on the white team, on the Austin team. And this is a play that uh, it looks like he makes a full effort. He's on the ground, but he just misses it. And this is one where everybody says, ah, bad luck. This was a tough play. But if you watch the action movement of the setter, after he sets the ball, he takes three Just steps back. And then if he just stood where he was and didn't move, the ball would be an easy ball. The rally would be going. So here he sets and he moves two meters backwards. So he's almost perfect reception and he's on three meter line when the, the player... Uh, the blocker touches the ball. Okay. Um, in your system of coverage, uh, let's say it on, on a ball like this one, who will be responsible for the long balls touch for the block and uh, how the other uh, players should be uh, 
placed in order to, to take the short balls and to have the possibility for a counter attack? I don't have fixed positions. I don't practice fixed positions. I want to have one player long. So if it's good reception and the pipe attack, uh, the pipe is available, then it will be the libero um, being longer. But the, the rule is that after the, after the spike or before the spiker touches the ball, then everybody should be still. If everybody is still, then um, you have the best chance to chase every ball. So we're not looking to cover spaces. We are looking to be ready to uh, to chase the to chase the ball. Okay, let's just watch it for the last time. He wants to cover. He's ready to cover. He wants to help his player. But the two steps that he makes means that it's impossible. And in I, volleyball, there are lots and lots of these two steps that don't look like they are important, but they are important. But here, he's not moving still. I mean, he's charted just, but it's it's pretty obvious that it, could, it couldn't be a, a hard hit. So... It's very improbable that the ball is going to to go long. So, yeah, but it's it's too yep. fast of an action. So it's hard to just be like Irvin, stand and watch. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to the next one then. Uh, it's eight. Okay, this is one action. Everybody is, uh, it's a bad reception. The set is pretty good. The, all the players are ready to cover and the spiker tries to go block out on a difficult situation. So it's uh, all logical and just a bad luck because of the reception. So if we stop on the set on the spiker's contact, And then we see, so we stop there. So the this is a, a, a really common action. It's not always so far from the, the antenna, but uh, spikers, especially position four spikers, when they have the ball that's inside, they try to attack the line blocker and they want to go, they want to play this block out shot. So exactly um, the the shot that the Sivalki player is playing here, and for some reason this is the the normal the the mentality the the first idea of the spiker, and as we point out here, that first thing is that he is four meters from the sideline, so he has no block out. He doesn't have the soft shot. If he wants to go block out, he has to hit strong. But if he wants to recycle and he has one, two, three, four players in front of him and all of these players are ready and these players are ready to cover, but he plays some different shot that has almost no chance of success. My question is, are they actually ready? Because this is the this is the contact. Okay, let's say they read the situation and saw that he's not going to to spike hard. It, it will be a soft shot, but they're pretty straight up. They are not kneeing. It, okay. it is in principle okay, but I th I think for me uh, being ready means to be still. If you are still then you have a chance to, to make a step in the direction that you, you have to play. If you are moving, you have no chance. But, okay, uh, I'm also saying this to, to make the point in this situation. Of course, he is not making a decision. He's not watching if the cover is ready because he has other things to worry about. So he, he has to trust that the cover is there. Um, 
but I think that in this case the cover is is pretty good. Yeah, do you think that the liberal can react better? Because here he's moving, he's just here, he's stopping almost, and then uh, uh, it couldn't be it couldn't be his fault fully, but he could he have reacted better? There are some liberals that can get this ball, and you you see it sometimes, but it's not uh, it's. It's Grubenikov because Grubenikov um, is is fast and he sees situations early. If this was my team, I would I would say that the the Libero actually should stay long. If he's setting from nine meters, then he should stay uh, in the back half of the court to um, to cover the the longer ball. So, okay. In this play, as it unfolds, maybe he could have done um, better at saving the situation, but it was still a bad choice by the spiker. Question from Yanis. Um, okay, let's just remove it. Are there any statistics available for recycling line cuts versus cross cuts? My coach used to say that to successfully receive, there is a generally better chance to do it with line shots. Hmm. Um, I don't. I don't have those statistics. They might exist. Um, my first thought is that if if I want to play for me to cover, then the line the line blocker is the best option because it's right in front of me. But if I want to make it easy for the for the other players, um, then uh, then the best for me, the best angle is the angle that goes uh, back towards the middle of the court because that's where most of the players are. I would generally also say to to recycle against the middle blocker because the middle blocker is the biggest blocker. It's the easiest one to recycle against. And in this regard, what do you think about this modern tendency to, in order to try to 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 play it again just to to attack with a pass on the block and then to and then for your for you him, yourself or for the for your uh, teammates to cover and then organize the second I think, third attack i think that it's a really good technique um it's with two hands it's easier to control the ball uh, and especially if you w want to to recycle yourself if you're playing for yourself uh, it's really good um, I think it should be illegal, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that's a different conversation. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that we are both a little bit more conservative here with uh, the new tendencies of. Uh, for, for me, I'm I'm a big opponent of that one. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't mind that um, <laughs> because I don't. There are some that are throws and more more than others, but I the two-handed contact is always a throw. It's it just is always a throw. So every time when Micheletto goes like this, it's a throw. It's one-handed. I don't want to say that it takes more skill, but um, the object of playing the ball with two hands is to increase control and change the direction of the ball. And this is the definition of a throw. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's um, I. When you watch Schliefke play, it's amazing what he can do with the ball, and that he that he invented this kind of play with Kovacevic is great. Um, I can appreciate the play and the intelligence, and not want to see it uh, allowed. Okay, next one, number nine. Not so the, good the play, defense. Are, the play we are watching there is the uh, Monza defender in position one. On on this situation, where should the defender be? Because I think they're they're closing the antenna. Sure. 
for I'm not uh, really worried about where the player is for the the first contact. The the action that I'm looking at is the the second contact and the movement of position one defender. Now. The ball, the ball is defended, and oh, you, you can see the action. You can, uh, you can, you can explain. You don't see. Uh, you mean the the opposite, the opposite in position one for the white team. The opposite. I mean the, the position one, one. Who, one who has the ball in his hand. So the the play doesn't go to him. And as soon as the first the soon as the attack is not going to him, he starts to get ready for attacking. And he gets ready for attacking, he takes two steps back. And if he stood where he was and waited, then he would keep this ball alive without even falling on the ground. Hmm. So it's a different version of the um, uh, of the set of covering that we had a couple of videos ago. And this one is a really, really common one. And you'll see it, the opposites and position fours especially. As soon as the first ball doesn't go in their direction, they run to uh, they run to attack. They want to get ready to attack, and you will see. I don't want to say in every match two or three balls like this, but uh, it happens a lot. Which play you mean should have taken the ball position two, or no, the opposite. So position one. He stands stop. He moves back before the defender. I touches. mean, you mean you mean the second touch? I I, I just uh, yes, uh, yes 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 yes. Because Sorry, because touch. yeah because because uh, my my concentration is that the first touch should have been much better. That's that's why I am a little bit confused yeah. because I, I have concentrated more on the on the first touch. I oh. I think here here. It's pretty obvious that it will be a a, a, a tip. Probably yeah. he's not seeing it the best the best possible way. Firstly, firstly, my my interpretation is that with with the block uh, closing the antenna, okay, it depends on the on the defending system, but but the position five should be a little bit more inside, and taking this uh, this tip. Uh, pretty easily and that's why i think the first the, f the first error here is of position five it should be defended much much better and then the second one because i don't think the opposite is in okay he could have taken it but it's i don't think it's his fault honestly he he moves before he knows what the action is going to be and he moves away from the ball if he doesn't move, and he, you, if you watch, he starts to move before the middle blocker, and it's the middle blocker, before he even touches the ball. So he's waiting for the middle blocker to make a perfect defense and somebody to set to him. And this, you can, uh, the first contact can be better, but it's a tip inside three meters. It's, a, it's never going to be a, a good situation. And the the player he moves, and because everybody is looking at the tip defender, nobody pays attention to um, to the second to the attacker who could have played the ball and kept it alive if he didn't move. Okay, let's go to number ten. Number ten, number ten. Okay, let's do it in that way. And this is number ten. <laughs> that's that's probably the funniest one. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, the average the average viewer would say, "What a great uh, action!" 
Probably. <laughs> this one, let's play it again. This one is a great action. I actually really like the block and the defense. And the thing that I like about this is that is that uh, it's Kvalik here because they're doing good things. I'll say the names. Um, Kvalik is, he doesn't run to some imaginary position that is supposed to spike from. He, uh, he doesn't think I have to get to the outside. He doesn't think I need to have an approach. He says, this is as far as I can get before the setter touches the ball. And this is where I will stay. And I will play the ball from here. I can always do something to my advantage. And Brizard uh, can, uh, it's not a great set, but it's close to the net. And he sees that Kvalek is not moving. And it's a really simple play. And it's a simple play by not moving. So uh, I, I said uh, already, uh, be like Irvin and don't move around too much. And this is it. So stop on the contact. Yeah. Okay, he stops so before the setter touches the ball and the setter puts it somewhere close and he can do whatever he wants. It's it's more of a basketball play, this one. It's it's an emergency play because the set's not perfect, but because he's not running, he's not jumping, he's not he's just standing in one place and jumping up, then it's much easier to know where his body where his body is. And he knows that if it, it's fast, the block and defense will not be ready. And there it is. The ball is on the floor before the defenders can even process uh, what happened after the attack. So, Yeah, let's also appreciate the, the, the defense of Wojtaszek. Uh, this is really good for like i said this is a perfect block and um this is where i like position five to be uh and if the ball goes past the block it's a it's an easy defense for for a player like that we have a question but i believe it's for the for the previous uh for the previous uh video would you rather have the setter to go to the opposite or pipe in that scenario though in, in this exact scenario, uh, this was the, the best option by far. Because ah, yeah, yeah, it's, it's for this one, not for the for the previous one. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the it's the best option because this the the opposite is coming uh, is still coming off the net after his uh, after blocking. Okay, he makes he makes good position. Um, so it's actually a really good move. Um, by Superlek, I think so. Uh, he could play him, but this is the this is the best option because it's it's the fastest, and it, the counter attack happens before the block can be ready. If he set the ball back to uh, back to the opposite, then um, the blocker ha the block has time to to get ready, has time to move, and um, the it's a good situation for the opposite, but it's a better situation. For this and yeah one, one thing about this kind of play is that the object is not to have a good swing so when when i was brought up in volleyball we needed to have a good transition because we want to have a full approach and so we can spike strong but the best attack is not always the best swing it's the it's getting the ball to the net fast so you can put it on the ground before the defender is ready. And it's a, it's a different mentality. So they are not thinking about spiking. They are just thinking about, uh, about scoring. And it it's seems like a small difference, but it's a really big difference. Yeah, and one more, uh, one more comment. That's a great move from the outside hitter, but not good decision-making for the setter. I, I, I've explained why I think that's a great play. Um, so we'll we'll have to agree to disagree. <laughs> okay, uh, we have two more left, two more videos. Uh, that's the first one. Uh, 
this is the the same play, um, the same situation. Uh, stop, stop there. It's the if we look at the on the yellow team, the spiker in position four, and it's the same situation that we had with the the opposite in position one, where the first reaction is to move back to uh, back to spike instead of just watching and he could have easily played this ball um, and the opposite had another chance to to attack. Here, who is taking the first touch? I mean, let's say this. Right, uh, the cover. Okay, it's, it's the middle blocker, yeah. so. The two players are on the ground. The setter is behind the two players on the ground. But even if the... Even if that wasn't the case, the first in instinct of the receiver should be to look at the situation and see if he has to play the second or the third ball. And a lot of uh, a lot of players they they think they need to get back early, but they always have a more time than they think. In this in this level. When the guys are one meter ninety five seven two meters, they only need one step to to have to be able to have a good approach. They don't need to to get two two meters out of the court or or any of that uh, stuff that uh, that you and I learned when we were juniors. And so they have no reason, no excuse that they can't be calm, look at the action, uh, stand. I have to play it. Uh, I can play it. I don't have to play it. I still have time to attack. Yeah, probably the middle blocker could have done it a little bit better to to help. But anyway, uh, it's an error from the from the outside hitter. Okay, let's go to the last one then. All right. The last one. It's okay. I don't know if this is a good one to finish. I, I'm not going to, uh, if this was the first one, I would let it run a little bit. But the, the player that we that we want to watch here is the, is the French setter. French? We, yeah, the French setter. So he sets the pipe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good ball. And the first thing that he does is to go to run to the back of the court to take the free ball. So... The ball bounces off uh, the defender's chest and Brizard runs to seven metres and then has to run back to the net instead of um, just staying there and uh, and making the play. And in this situation, there's no, uh, there were no other options. Um, there wasn't really a, actually, if he... <laughs> Uh, if he had just gone to the net waiting for the free ball, he could have played that one uh, back also. But they won the rally because they were a good team. Um, but just because you win the rally doesn't mean that everything went smoothly. Yeah, let's let's see it for last time. And I should be honest and say that when I was going through these the uh, this afternoon to choose the clips. I actually had to read the text to, that I wrote at the time <laughs> to remind myself what the error was. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not that clear for this one for sure. Even though even though it's right, I mean, it's I I I could agree for sure through the with this interpretation. Especially when you have Grebennikov, you 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 don't have to care for for the for the free ball to be taken and uh, processed uh, in the best possible way. You should be able to trust that, but yeah. the point, the 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 point in, in the end is that there are lots of small plays um, that uh, where a player makes one or two steps, um, and but those one or two steps uh, make a really big impact on the play that follows. And I joke about uh, about Irvin 
um, and standing around, but it's one of the really big uh, lessons I think that you can learn watching him play is that he looks lazy because he's not running around, but he's always in the right position. And he's in the right position a lot of the time because he doesn't move into the wrong position. He waits to see what is what the play is and he makes one step where other players will make three steps in one direction, then two steps back and one step back. And they look like they are doing work, um, but looking like working and working are not the same thing. Um, okay, Mark, thank you a lot uh, for this beautiful explanations on all those 12 videos plus uh, additional questions from the from the audience i'm very uh grateful for from your side doing this podcast seminar like i i like to uh, to name that and uh, i'm sure that it it was a pleasure also for the spectators the viewers that uh, watch that podcast thank you again uh, thank you. Uh, it was fun to go through those in a, a back and forth way. Uh, so that was that was good. Um, you can, uh, if guys, if watchers are interested, uh, you can find me on uh, social media, marklebedu.com. Um, yeah, I, I put I put the website in the in the description of the of the of the podcast, so people can can check it. Can check it, and, uh, and I'm always happy to answer questions that come up um, just in the course of the day, not just on the not just on the Great Volleyball Explained uh, webinars. Yeah, uh, from Myrna O'Reilly, thank you, uh, lots of great info, and Tianis uh, Kolozowskis, thank you for the helpful lessons. Uh, thank you also for your comments; uh, they are much appreciated. Thank you very much. Fabrice, Fabrice Tonoir, thanks, coach, also for Fabrice. Thank you. Uh, and, of course, uh, you're always invited for a second part of this one uh, later in the year. Yeah. All right. I'll start collecting clips for right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks also from Buyan uh, Petev. Uh, thanks to everyone watching. And... Uh, uh, I have an idea. I I will try to do it uh, as soon as possible as uh, the guest the, um, uh, could do it. But uh, I'm planning to do a Japanese podcast with not Japanese, uh, unfortunately, but uh, in order to to comment uh, why the Japanese volleyball is in a, such a big progress. So. Uh, uh, Okay, just one more question from Yanis. Request for a course, Mark. Could you please do a tutorial for making yourself available to sets as much as possible as a middle blocker? Uh, in attack, that means uh, for attack. Yanis, uh, uh, okay. if you could please add and explain uh, further probably. Yanis, uh, write to me on uh, on on Facebook or something and uh, uh, explain what you mean. And maybe I already have one, but uh, but I'm sure I can come up with something. Okay, uh, that was perfect. Thanks for everyone uh, who watched this podcast seminar, and I hope that you're going to do it next time. And until then, bye bye. See you later.